Good morning, everybody. How are we all today? Um, welcome to our our latest free webinar. Um, the council house bells in Nottingham are ringing, so it's uh, it must be eleven o'clock. Um, and I want to want to welcome everybody who's here today. Want to welcome our guests, Neil, Dan, and Carl. Um, hope you're all all well. Um, and what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to be talking about preparing your business and your clients for next time. Um, and what do, we, what do we mean by that? Well, if we look back to uh, March and April, huge numbers of consumers were understandably really concerned about the effect of COVID on themselves personally um, and on their short and long-term financial future. And in our experience, advisors and planners reacted differently and probably fell into three broad camps. Um, the first of those was that they proactively communicated with clients. They, they reached out by telephone, uh, they picked up the phone to, to their clients, um, they uh, increased the frequency of they increased the frequency of email communications, um, and they, they were there for their clients. Second, they took a more reactive approach. I'm here for you if you want to chat. And third, did nothing. They did absolutely, absolutely nothing. Um, and while March and April was clearly unlike any period that we've, we've seen before, um, it does appear in the UK that we're heading back, back that way in, in UK and Europe and, and North America. And of course, stock market volatility is a, is a permanent fixture. Um, so today I want us to learn from the past um, and build a blueprint for the future. Um, and frankly, who better to do that in the company of Carl and Neil? Um, and I'm like a kid in a sweet shop having you two on this webinar today. Really, really looking forward to it. Um, uh, before we get there, I want to do a bit of housekeeping. Dan, Dan Campbell is our head of branding and um, keeps me sane on these webinars and helps control things. Um, so, Dan, can you uh, introduce yourself? Sure thing. Um, hi, everyone. So I'll be the person to blame if anything goes wrong. So be kind, won't you? And ultimately, in the interest of keeping good time today, we're going to keep all the questions till the end. So we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask anything that's cropped up during the past hours session. There are two ways you can do that. So if you just want to put it in the chat function on the bottom, I'll be keeping an eye on those and just noting everything down so I can ask Neil and Carl later on. Um, there is a Q&A box as well. So if you'd rather do it that way, we can keep an eye on those. So um, whichever way you'd like to ask your questions, um, just put those through. Um, the webinar will be recorded as well, um, so we'll be editing that down later on today, and I think that link will get sent, is it the morning, um, oh, or later on today? Uh, I'll try and get it out tonight, I'll try and get it out tonight. Um, thank you, thank you Dan. Um, like I said, 60 minutes of, of Carl and Neil, both Carl and Neil have delighted to say that they're going to stay around afterwards to, to answer any questions we've got, so keep those, keep those questions coming. Um, but let's start with a couple of introductions. Um, Carl, for anybody who doesn't know you on the call, call um, just introduce yourself to them, would you? Sure. Uh, thanks, first of all, Phil for and Dan for putting this all together. Neil, super exciting to chat with you today. Um, in terms of introductions, I uh, am a financial planner. I write and I try to take complex things and make them simple. Um, and for the last couple of years, I've been doing that all over the world. So lived for three and a half years in New Zealand. We just moved to London in January. I've loved, I mean, you know, circumstances withstanding have loved our time here. Um, and uh, really excited to be chatting today. Thanks, Carl. Neil? Yeah, so Neil Bage, I'm the, the founder of a behavioral insights company called um, BIQ. Um, not a great deal more to add to that. I just want to echo Carl's opening there. I'm and yours, Phil. You know, this is a really exciting um, hour, hopefully, with great conversation. And it's great to be on the virtual stage with Carl. I think we shared a stage a few years back at a nucleus conference from uh, from, from memory. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, it's great to have these conversations. So I'm looking forward to diving in. Cheers, Carl, and cheers, Neil. Thank you. Um, so let's think back to to March and April. Um, those uh, seems a long while ago, doesn't it? Um, but thinking back to March and April, um, what did Carl? What do you think clients needed from their financial planner at that point? Yeah, a lot, right? I mean, I, I and and I think 
It's really interesting. Um, the only thing scarier than flying in a really small plane in turbulent weather is seeing your pilot scared. And I, and I think that you've got that juxtaposed against this idea that clients really needed empathy. And so that's a fine line to, to it's sort of a fine, you know, a, a needle to thread, if you will. How can you be empathetic without transference of stress, right? And I think we, sometimes we forget, and this is true even in the UK, <laughs> that first a hug, you know, and then a lecture. And, and I think the idea, what, what happens when um, you, you, you mistake, so maybe this is an even better way to say it. What clients needed was a guide. What they didn't need was a defender of an outdated map. So real financial planners are guides in changing landscapes. They're not defenders of outdated maps. If you understand the subtle difference there, you understand that if you're with a guide on a mountain and I've done some guiding and I've been guided and I've been in really, really stressful situations on rivers and mountains with people. And if you're a guide on a mountain and a storm rolls in, you don't blame the, if you're being guided, you don't blame the guide for the storm, right? I mean, you might because you're scared, nervous. You might want to throw something at you. You might want to vent a bit. And if you do, a guide will say, you know, give it to me. You know what I mean? Like, let it out. Like, I, I understand. And then here's this fine line we've got to thread. They might say something like, you know, I didn't anticipate the storm either. That's different than, oh my gosh, I'm scared too. Right? So how to be empathetic without transferring stress. And then the second piece of this guide defender thing that's so important is, if a client, if you get mad at the guide for the storm, the last thing a qualified guide is going to do is try to defend. Well, what do you mean? I looked at the thing. I did the thing. Don't you realize that if you miss the 10 best days of any 20 years, you, you know, like throwing charts, spraying people with facts and figures, that's what defenders do. What guides do is they say, yeah, I didn't anticipate this storm either. Right. And to be honest, when I look at the news, I get nervous as well. But you and then they reach across the thing and they grab somebody by the neck and they say, you're coming with me. We're going this way. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen this way, but I do know I got all these tools in my backpack and I am uniquely qualified to take your situation and what's going on in the world and help guide you through it. Right. Come with me. And so that's that's what I think people needed. They needed guides. They didn't need defenders. They needed guides. So hopefully that's that's helpful. Thanks, Carl. That's really really helpful. Neil, what have you got to add to that? What do, what do you think clients needed from their their planner? I think we're going to get this a lot today, Phil. I'm going to kind of echo some more Carl said because it's absolutely it, it kind of is from a behavioural perspective. It just it's it's common sense. I use a different phrase to Carl. He uses he uses the word guide. I've said for a long time what financial planners need to be during turbulent times is uh, is a navigator. They need to help clients navigate the landscape, and it's the same as it's the same analogy that Carlos has given as the guide. Um, what did what did they need to be? They needed to be visible to start with. They needed to clients needed to know that they were there, and they needed to be reassuring. They needed to do you know as Carl just said. I use this phrase. They needed someone just to say, "Are you okay?" You know, I don't want to talk about your financial plan. I just want to know if you're okay because there is a lot to deal with. You know, we've got the markets are volatile. We're going on a lockdown. There's a pandemic sweeping the world, earth. You know, you, your, your partner's at home all of the time. That's a lot of stuff to deal with. And it's fine if we can compartmentalize and deal with that one step at a time. But when it's dropped on our laps in one fell swoop, that's actually quite overwhelming. And one of the things we know from the behavioral, from a psychological perspective, is we're not very good at dealing with uncertainty and when we are over, overwhelmed, if you like. So for, for me, 
it, it, it's about being visible, it's about reassuring, but just echoing another word Carl said there, it's about being empathetic. And I'm gonna break that down quickly into two. So, so there's two types of empathy, if you like, there's cognitive empathy and then there's effective empathy. And, and cognitive empathy is just knowing what people are going through and, and, and recognizing that they're going through a tough time because we, because we recognize that. Effective empathy is when we feel what other people are feeling. And, and, I, and I would argue since March, there's, we've dipped in and out of cognitive and effective empathy. But you know, it's absolutely right. It's very difficult to be empathetic with somebody without and not transfer your own stresses and anxieties and, and worries on them. So it's a real fine line. It's, it's, a, it's a fine line to tread. It's a real balance that we need to come out to, to have in order to deliver an, an empathetic outcome to clients. But ultimately, Phil, you know, for me, it, it's, it's, it's about just being there and telling people that you are there, but not being um, paternalistic, if you like, and saying to people, I know what's going on, but you need to stick to the plan. Ignore the noise, ignore this, ignore that, because we're human beings and we all navigate this world in our own unique way. And therefore having someone by your side to help you navigate through the most turbulent and horrible times can only ever be a good thing. Cool. Phil, can I... Can I mention one thing real quick? Of course, cool, go for it. Yeah, it was a, a super fun uh, conversation. I, look, one thing that I think is important, I just had, we had, um, yesterday I had this conversation where I interviewed Seth Godin and we, about his new book, and we talked about uh, being authentic. And he calls authenticity a trap, which was really surprising to a lot of us because we've all been thinking like, oh, you're supposed to be authentic. You're supposed to be authentic. And I think this is an interesting place where this comes up. Right, because like internally, you know, Neil used the word visible. Like it's absolutely what clients needed, right? And this wasn't one of those things like in years past, you know, you would call a client and go, hey, I just wanna see if you're worried about what? And the client would go, oh, should I be? This isn't one of those. We can count on the fact that everybody knew that something <laughs> was going on, right? So this is one of those where you just call and say, hey, I was thinking about you today. You know, thought I would check in, zip. Like, you don't have to say, like, I was thinking about you because your portfolio is down. I was thinking about you today. thought I'd call and check in, right? But so visible, and it's the last thing you wanted to do, right? Because you wanted to be under the covers as well, right? Like, you wanted to be in your bunker. I mean, you're a human. Not only that, your whole, not only are you a human dealing with this, your whole business is wrapped up in it. Like, that's why this thing's so tough, Right? And so you didn't feel like doing that. And this is where this authentic thing, authenticity is a trap comes in is like, like internally we can all say, hey, I got you, my friend. Like, I didn't feel like it either. Hugs. And then that's the empathetic hug. The punch in the nose is, I don't care because it's your job. You know what I mean? And I mean that gently, but it's like, that's where Seth says authenticity is a trap. Plumbers don't show up and go, yeah, I just not feel like it today. Like the drain, I don't feel like I'm plugging a drain. Ugh. My authentic self says that I, so we don't get to show up and go, you know, I, and let me just, sorry, last story. I remember in 2008, uh, 2008, early 2009, I was in a meeting with Dan and Barbara. Dan and Barbara had never been scared before in a decade of working with me. They were terrified. Um, I was scared. I live in Vegas at like ground zero of the housing crisis. And I remember, you know, telling them what they needed to do, which was essentially like, let me hear you, empathy, empathy, empathy. Okay, great, let's review the plan. Okay, cool, let's stay the course, right? And I remember walking out the door and I can remember the door handle. because so I remember looking at the door handle of the conference room as I shut it. And I thought to myself for the first time in my career, oh my gosh, I hope I'm right, right? Because I didn't know. Now, empathy, or sorry, authenticity would have been Dan and Barbara, I hope I'm right. I don't know. I, this is really like, sorry, that's not your job. Your job sometimes, sometimes overconfidence plays a positive role. We know from some of the military strategy work, right? Sometimes you have to look people in the eyes and go, I don't know, right? In your mind, you're thinking, I don't know, but I'm the best one to lead you through this. And so I think this authenticity piece, like we can be authentic with each other. We can meet and have a group hug. We can do whatever we need to, to get through it. And then we have to say, I'm sorry, it's your job. You're a plumber and your job right now is to show up in front of the public because guess what? Those people need you and they don't know where to look 
and they're getting people who just spray facts and figures at them and tell them they're dumb. What they need is somebody who says, I understand this is serious and I've got you. You're coming with me this way. So anyway, thanks for letting me just share a bit more. Now it's fascinating. And picking up from that, Carl, um, question for both of you. If, if that's your job is picking up on your point, Carl, if that's your job, um, specifically you both work with some fantastic financial planning firms. What did you see those firms do well? What were, they, what were the things they did that went well and that they should do again and they do again if we ever face a similar situation? Neil, go for that first, if that's all right. Yeah, so I guess there's three things, two of them, which I, I, um, I think are just general, but one of them is very specific to the work that I do. So, so um, the firms that I work with, I know emailed all of their clients um, as soon as they possibly could, but they didn't just send out a blanket email. They sent out emails, personal emails to all of their clients. Um, yes, there have been parts of that text of the copy that will have been uniform, but ultimately that message was to Neil Bage and Sandra Bage about our situation and what's going on in our lives at that point in time. And that worked, that from, from, from feedback, that seemed to land really well. The thing that I think worked really well is the firms that kind of I worked with to deliver webinars to their clients, you know, putting me directly into the living room of their of, of 30, 40, 50 clients, and me just having a talk and doing that, you know, just saying, you know, if you feel anxious and you feel worried and you're scared and you're unsure, then you know what? Welcome to the world of being a human being because it's perfectly normal to feel those things when when there's so much uncertainty and 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 noise a, a, around us, and you know, and me engaging with you know, real clients, if you like, and getting them to ask questions seem to work really well. And I know there's a few people on this on this um, call today who who did that with me and, and you know, they can tell you how, how well that seemed to, to go down with clients. But from a more personal perspective, um, Phil, what I've found is the people who have worked with me and, and are starting to use the, the tools we developed for the first time could segment their clients by behavioral propensity. And what that did is it gave them a map of who to speak to first and the reason why they should be speaking to them first. So what it did is in a, in a bank of 150 clients, it said there are seven people who we can tell you from their be unconscious behavioral characteristics, their behavioral biases, and, and how they navigate the world, that they are currently sitting at home kind of melting in their own anxiety. And therefore you need to get on the phone to them. But by the way, of this group of people, this small cohort, if you like, there will be people in there who, when you say to them, are you, are you okay, will say, yeah, I'm fine. But the behavioral characteristics that we've revealed will tell you that they're not fine at all because they have conflicting paradoxical biases going on at, at the time that you're engaging with them. And the feedback from those advisory firms has been that that insight the ability to know who to speak to, when to speak to them, and what to speak to them about has been a godsend for them. And of course, they don't do it though, though, that, that in isolation. It's a mixture of those three things, you know. So it's knowing who to speak to, sending a broader message out to their clients in a way where they can engage through this technology, but then reassuring them in, in a way that they can just sit and read an email and kind of those three things together tell clients that you're in their corner and that you're there for them and that you're willing, you, you know. Yeah, you're in their corner. Melting in their own anxiety. That's a phrase, isn't it? Yeah, I made that up. I, I think it works. Right. It might not work. I but... think it works. I think, I think it works. <laughs> you're winning, yeah. I think you win today's webinar with that phrase. That's a fantastic phrase. Um, Thank you. Carl, what did you see that, what did you see that worked well? Um, and what mistakes did you see firm planners make? Yeah, I, look, I, I think I, just being visible. And, you know, in terms of like specific tactical things that I saw people do was, and, I, and I, I think there's like, there's a really important human element of this as to why we don't do it. I think whenever there's a burning building, like you, you feel like you have to know how to put the fire out if you're going to rush in, right? And in this case, you don't, you don't have a solution. What people need is space anyway. In fact, they don't really, in all the wisdom traditions pointed to this, right? Like you don't have to, to be of service to someone. You don't have to solve their problems, right? Often they just need to be heard and seen and given a space to talk about it. 
And so I think if you can understand that, it, it, will, it will lower the pressure. Because sometimes they're like, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do it. Well, it turns out I don't know how to solve it, so I'm not going to do it. Well, it turns out solving is not the thing you're trying to do. And so creating space for that to happen was, you know, and that happens on a one-to-one -one level. I thought, I thought I, phone calls are amazing to me. Like, just pick up the phone and call someone. And, and you don't need to alert them. My favorite line, we already reviewed it, was, hey, I was thinking about you today. And now you're only allowed to say that if it's true, but you can, you can make it true by pulling up your list of clients and thinking about them. I was thinking about you today. I just thought I would check in, right? And no need to say any more. Are you scared? Are you nervous? You're like thinking, how are you, right? And, and, and how are you, right? Not... How are you? Fine, fine. You're busy. busy. I'm busy. You too. I'm busy. And then, so that's one on one. And then I loved, loved a good uh, a friend of mine in the states started doing. The, he called them town halls. They were just public meetings on Zoom. He said, "Look, I don't have an agenda. I just want to talk about it. I think I can answer. You might have questions or concerns. Let's hop on. If and this is one of my favorite lines. If you look." We want to keep these intimate and small, but if you have friends or family that might benefit from being there, feel free to invite them, right? So that's a way to invite somebody to refer somebody to you in a way that they would say, thank you. Like, that's what I'm always looking for. Is there a way to help them understand the value of this? So I saw a number and, and, and participated in some like Neil did where these were just gatherings of people who had questions and just needed a space to talk. And when advisors did that, I actually, this happened, you know, this was one in the UK, um, a, a, a planner named Justin held one and, and I was there. And one of the questions was from somebody, if, if somebody had invited and they said, we haven't heard a word from our advisor. And we, here we are at a meeting with somebody else's advisor, giving a chance to talk about it. And we're really disappointed. And, and that was an interesting lesson for me that like just getting out in front, creating space, giving people an opportunity to chat, realizing you didn't have to solve the problem. All people really wanted to do was be heard, ask really good questions, right? At least initially. So that's what I saw that people did well. What I, what I saw that didn't work was when people hid. And it's so easy to find places to hide right now. So please know that I, like, I love you and I'm with you and I, I feel it too. Right. I, I was looking out the window this morning thinking, geez, are we going to go into another lockdown and am I going to be able to do it? And I just want to go back to bed. And then you think, wait, I got a job to do so I can be authentic later and, uh, and we'll get to work. So yeah, hiding didn't work. And to me, it, this feels like a massive, I, I mean, I'm hesitant to call it an opportunity because it's not really the, 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 the tone that I'm trying to strike, but it is a massive opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. And because very few people are doing it and everyone needs it. So right now I would just be, I would, every interaction I have with a client, if I was a planner right now and I have an interaction with a client and, and we have a conversation that's useful, as soon as that conversation is over, I would pick up my iPhone or my iPhone, on, my camera on my iPhone or voice memos on my iPhone and I would record that story. And I would use a friend instead of client. I'd say, John, a friend of mine, we were just having a chat. And he had a question about this. And these are the exact words I would use. He had a question about this. And instead of saying, I answered it, I would say, we went on to have a conversation like this. And then I would hit save and I would post that in public. I would send that email to 10 friends and say, hey, I just had this conversation. You might find it useful. You know, other people that might find it useful, feel free to share. And I would just do that every single conversation I had, because you're having the conversation anyway. Why not make a bigger difference? Absolutely. And Neil, you, 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 didn't, do, you didn't, we didn't call them town hall meetings, but I know you spent a lot of time doing uh, webinars and spending time with the clients of financial planners. It sounds like you were doing a similar thing. Yeah, it was. It actually was um, different. Same event, but by going by a different name. So we, um, I, I didn't go on there with an agenda. I didn't go on there to do a presentation. What I did is I, I kind of set the scene from a, 
and, and actually I did work, work, I focused on the area that is, is, is my background. So I focused on kind of the neuroscience of it, you know, the, the, what's going on in the brain and, and how you can't ignore the fact that we're human at the heart of this and how our, you know, the, the amygdala will trigger the hypothalamus, we're going to fight and flight and blah, 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 blah. So I set the scene of this is what's going on inside of your head that you're not aware of. This is what's going on in the world right now. And when those two things come together, it creates a bit of a mess. Let's talk. And it, and it, um, and it, and it seemed to go down, it, it did, it, it, it went down really well. And, and a lot of the questions I had back from clients, ultimately, if I had to kind of categorize them at a high level, were, am I gonna be okay? <laughs> It, it was it was that fundamental, you know. People clearly showed anxiety and worry about what's going on. And inc incidentally, by the way, that wasn't that wasn't about their finances. You know, we need to remember that that in March, April, May time, I would argue that actually their financial well-being dropped down below their kind of physical and mental well-being. Um, those three things kind of move around depend on, on on what's going on in the world. But um, so it, it was it was for all intents and purposes to use the same phrase Carl's just said it was a it was a town hall esque uh, event where you just talk and you listen and you engage and you put people's minds at rest. And you no, know, just picking up on that actually, you talked about their financial well being and their individual personal well being being at different levels. How do you see those two things interacting as we move into the next few months and what's happening in the UK right now? I think the same thing will happen, Phil. I, so I, I, we tend to talk about financial well-being uh, as this kind of cog in the well-being machine, if you like. That it's this little independent thing, but every aspect of our well-being interacts with the, each other, the other aspect, right? So you, you don't get one without it impacting the other. So we know our financial well-being impacts on our mental well-being. We know this, and we know that our mental well-being has an impact on our physical well-being. So we know that those three things are absolutely intrinsically linked. So I, for me, it goes back to that navigator comment. It's about advisors saying, look, I'm here by your side. And, I'm, and, if, and if you don't wanna talk about money, fine, fill your boots. I'm just here, I'm in your corner, I'm here to listen to you. And if you wanna vent about how you're feeling and your fears and your worries, or in the, in the positive, your dreams and aspirations, of course, I'm here to listen to you. But I, I, I think, pigeonholing conversations into, I, I need to talk to them about their finances, I think may just add to the anxiety that they're feeling. But, but there's another aspect to this, Phil, that, and, it, and it kind of harks back to the question you just asked about what did, ad, what did advisors do that, made, that didn't really work well. Um, I do find, speaking personally here, I do find conversations where advisors say to me, I tell my clients what to do and they do it. I find it, it, it's paternalistic. I actually find uh, it, it's a conversation that makes me very uncomfortable because we, I don't think we should be quote unquote telling clients what to do. And I, and I get why that happens, right? There's a lot of people, a lot of advisors I speak to who say, what I'm trying to do is stop clients acting irrationally, right? And I get that, I do get that, but that's too, that's too much of a simplistic phrase because there's two types of kind of rationality, if you like, there's economic rationality which is selling at the bottom of a market when you know you shouldn't. Is that rational? Of course it isn't. It is absolutely irrational to do that. You know, when the market's cheap or when anything's on sale, you know, you, you wouldn't walk down the supermarket aisle and see wine that's reduced from eight pound th to three pound and think I'm not doing, I'm not buying that. I'm, I'm, I'm running away from that. You would fill your trolley. Yeah, we don't do the same when the stock market is cheap. We don't do that, right? So that, that whole money thing is and from an economic perspective, creates irrational behavior. But then there's biological rationality, which is what three and a half million years of evolution have taught us, which is a, a need to feel safe and secure. And the stock market has become metaphorically that kind of you know, lion that used to chase us across the savannah. We haven't lost the, the, the triggers of fear and anxiety. They haven't vanished. They've been replaced with modern day life. So when we see the stock markets falling and we hear there's a pandemic, our biology, our evolution, our need to thrive and survive kicks in and we behave in a way that is wholly rational because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here today. So I think what happens sometimes in conversations with, with clients is advisors focus almost exclusively on economic rationality and telling clients, no, don't do that. Whilst at the same time, completely ignoring what's going on inside their heads 
and their biological rationality. And this is the thing that's made us all sit here today on this call and you know, survive three and a half million years of, of, of our evolution. So I think we need to just accept, and, I, and, I, and I, I know we do, but I think we need to put more of a focus on the human aspect of our relationships and not just the financial aspect. Thank you. Um, some great answers there to, to all those questions. Um, talking of questions, Dan, can you just remind people on the call how to leave their questions for Carl and Neil? Sure thing. So we've had a few questions trickle through on the chat. Um, nothing through the Q&A panel just yet. So uh, if anything comes to mind as um, Neil and Carl are speaking, just, just drop those um, in either and we'll, we'll get those later. Um, we have had a few comments just echoing um, the themes that have been spoken about, though, which have been quite interesting. So we had one from um, Chris saying that Neil did a talk for clients of Ovation and it went down really well. Um, so there was definitely value there. Um, and also one from Dan earlier um, that said, just a general comment that um, in the, the early days of the crisis, they picked up a, a number of new clients that basically said things such as, I am disappointed that I haven't heard from my advisor, um, or I have tried to contact my advisor, but they haven't got back to me. So that idea of just checking in, there's absolutely value there, isn't there? That visibility point is, is massive. Um, Carl, you're um, just about to open session eight of the fellowship the last one in 2020, I think. Um, what, what are the lessons in there that planners can use to prepare for, quote, unquote, the next time? Yeah. Yeah, so much. I have a bunch of questions about what Neil said. So I'll, uh, actually, I have to ask one. So sorry, Phil, I'm going to take over for a minute. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, what, could you distinguish real quickly for all of us, um, I, because I, I, I know we're on the same page, so I just want to make sure I understand. I sometimes want to be told what to do, mm -hmm. right? Like I want my advisor, what I want from my advisor is to understand me so completely that they can look me in the eyes and say, based on everything I know about you, especially when I'm under stress, I have a great financial planner. Her name's Christy. She's unbelievable. And when we're under stress, she can look me in the eyes and go, I got you. This is where we're going. This is what I want to essentially say, what would you do if you were me? And so the idea, sometimes that gets confused around, I do believe we tell people what to do, but it's only after, right? So it is very much a co-pilot, co-creation sort of thing. So are we on the same page there? Or is there some clarification that I need to understand? No, we're absolutely on the same page, Carl. What I mean is, so, so if, if I can look at you in the, in the whites of your eyes and I know you, and I, I don't know you at a superficial level, I know you, I understand. Both the your, economic uh, and the personal and the whole thing. Yeah. Everything, I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, not only how you, I know how you navigate the world. I know how you process information. I know what your unconscious mind does. More to the point, I know your values and principles and all of those things factor into me saying, Carl, come on, this is what we're doing. We're going this way. And they are, and at the heart of that statement is who you are. And, and, and it doesn't, it, and it's not about who Neil is, it's about who Carl is. Right. Completely agree with you. What I don't agree with is when people force their values and their principles right, right, right. on people and say, we're doing this and ignore the person. Because, yeah. you know, I think that just, cre I think that's, I think that's wrong. Um, so I think if the, if the landscape is correct and you absolutely know your client, then of course they would expect you to say no come on this is what we're going this way today and this is why but it's when you when you when you don't have that intimate knowledge of the client i i think it, it comes across as being kind of just paternalistic and me telling you what to do because i'm right you're wrong perfect yeah yeah that's something that we talk about actually in the fellowship is this idea of keep keep your values off my plan mm. Right. And, and we, that's tricky because we have, we may have beliefs about paying down debt. Like that's an easy one to pick on, or, or maybe a belief about how to fund education for a client or for a, a child. We may have personal beliefs, but we need to remember that the plan is the client's plan. And what I see most often when plans blow up because of poor behavior specifically, it's often because there was no connection. The plan didn't reflect the client's values, goals, wishes, desires in the first place. Correct. Right. So there was no emotional resonance to say, hey, I know you're feeling crazy, but remember this. There's no touchstone element of that there. So 
So yeah, perfect. And, and answer your question, Phil, the, the, the fellowship, I, like it's, it's hard for me because the more I talk about it, the less it seems to help people. Um, it's one of those deals where you just have to experience it, but it's, it's 21 declarations of what it means to be a real financial planner. It's my opinion of what it means to be a real financial planner. And some of those, a lot of those things are around this idea of guide, right? In a changing landscape. They're, they're around this idea of we, we, we listen, we have empathy, and mostly they're just remind, they're, they're both a calling, right? A rem, a, like I'm calling you to this better place and a reminder, I'm finding this to really be true here in the UK because there's so many good financial planners in the UK um, and your audience, particularly like the, the concentration, like I'm pre, we're all preaching the choir here, um, but it's a reminder of what, you've always known, but maybe not articulated or maybe not seen written. And so that's the kind of stuff. And in terms of getting you through, to me, what I need to show up and do my job is I need a little, I just, I need enough confidence. Sometimes I need enough confidence to fake it. It's fine. Like if I've got to just fake the fact that I'm confident Sometimes I need enough confidence to fake it. Other times I would hope that I have enough confidence to do the act, right? Do the thing. And one source of, con I think it's, we can build systems into our lives to protect our confidence a bit. And, you know, things like get enough sleep and, and eat well and do the exercise, like all those things. And another place we can get that is just a reminder of the value we provide and that's a lot of what the fellowship is about. It's like, hey, it's like this call, like, please remember this is your job. The people need you. So it serves as a, a place when I'm not feeling confident. One advisor who went through it called it a, a confidence forge or an IV. He's like, if I feels like an IV, I can hook up anytime. So that, that's how that was designed to help people in times when the plan blows up. Thank you, Carl. And don't go anywhere because I'm going to make you work a little bit harder in a second. Um, I just want to um, share my screen. Um, and just explain to everybody uh, briefly uh, before we get back to, to more questions for Carl and Neil. Um, the, the, special, uh, the special bundle that we've uh, arranged uh, with, with Carl. Um, so the cost of the, the fellowship is, is $500. Um, it's open from now. We'll give you a link shortly. Um, and anybody who signs up using the, the Yardstick link gets um, an exclusive bundle of Carl's sketches not known for as the sketch guy for nothing, Carl. Um, and we have selected um, three of your, your sketches, which we think will help financial planners prepare their clients for next time. Um, so anybody who signs up for the fellowship uh, using the link gets those three sketches. And the other thing we've done with them, which I think is really cool, is we've animated them as well. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, Carl- Wait, wait, you're, you're giving the animations Absolutely. as part of the- Absolutely. Huh. And even more, even better, you're now going to explain those animations, Carl. Um, so we've got the animations on here. Um, and Carl, just give us the 30 second pricey of this one um, and why we think this particular uh, animation and sketch is perfect for helping clients prepare for next time. Yeah, so let me just, I just want to understand something. So that's a, a little animated video file that you get You've done three of those, and I I can post those on social media anywhere I want, do whatever little content mm -hmm. snacks I can use. You can do whatever you like with them. So you've got the three animations, cool. the three Very sketches, cool. and fill your boots. Uh, planners who sign up can do whatever. <laughs> That's the second time I've heard that. I don't know what it means. Neil, what does fill your boots mean? <laughs> did I say fill your boots? No, I said yeah. No, you both did. You both now said fill your boots in this, in this call in the last 10 minutes. Anyway, need... I love these. I love conversation. I, I have a lot of these conversations with with um, our mutual friends Daniel Crosby and Brian Portnoy. When when I say something, and Daniel typically says, "I have no idea what you just said to me." <laughs> you know, <laughs> real English phrases. Yeah, for sure. So fill your boots. Leverage them as much as you can. Take advantage of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, anyway, I think that's. I I actually didn't hadn't seen these animations yet, and we've worked on these for uh, you know 10 years trying to get animations these are not this is not a cheap thing to put together so thanks for doing that phil so this this um 
this is look one of the things I try to do with the images when some of them when I'm when they're done right um, they are in fact my editor at the New York Times calls them confrontational without being off-putting right so we're trying to get away for you and I like originally these were for me with my clients I drew these for my clients was to point out a behavior that is kind of silly in hindsight but it, it allows it, it actually to give us an easy entry to a conversation about it right so there's a little bit of a little bit of a chuckle and this is one of the conversations that happens all the time like clients call and like i want to get out and we say oh is that a permanent decision oh no 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 i i want to get back in when things clear up right when the dust settles when things look better and and this is just pointing out a conversation that takes 20 minutes around let's define what it means when okay if we're going to sell today and you want to get back in when things clear up. I like to have a plan. Let's define what it means when things clear up. Right? And I often ask, like, what's the market going to look? What's the economy going to look like? What will the news look like? What will your friends be saying? And then the last question always is, if your friend, if the economy's better, the news is good, and your friends are happy, where do you think the market's going to be? Oh, it will be higher. Oh, so we on purpose are building a plan where you're going to sell low and buy high later on purpose. Well, this is an entry point to that conversation. So that's what that sketch is about. Thank you. Carl. I think, sorry, Phil, before you move on, I think yeah. what's interesting here with this type of sketch is <clears throat> as a follow-up, advisors can then send content around things really specific, which is what this illustration is all about, around things like loss aversion, sunk cost fallacy, disposition effect, you know, which actually just kind of concretes with science what this what this simple, beautiful illustration is telling you. Gives you more depth, if you like. So um there's a lot more depth that, that can be derived from, from just this conversation, which I think is great. That's one of my favorite things to have happen to me is I have really smart people show up and they, they have names for this stuff, right? And they, they like actually, um, um, Daniel Crosby does this to me too. He's like, do you know? And I was like, no, I was just drawn with a Sharpie over here in the corner, leave me alone, right? <laughs> Let's good. have a look at one of those Sharpie drawings. So here you go. Oh, oh no, it's the same one. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Here's the next one. Oh yeah, I love this one. I want to see if you actually were able to illustrate this right. That's yeah. This. Let's so see if they did this right. This is. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that was that's close. Really, really cool. Um, so yeah, my thought is look, uh, and I look. I know I am at risk of oversimplifying. And that's just the nature. You leave some nuance out when you do something with a Sharpie, right? Um, of course, algorithms can get some pretty complicated stuff in them. But this was just me pointing out like, look, algorithms are really good at solving what can fit in an algorithm. And complex adaptive systems don't always fit in algorithms. And humans and markets and their interaction is a complex adaptive system. And so I, I think that's, that's just sort of my sort of cheeky way of saying, look, algorithms are great at solving for what fits in an algorithm, but you and your money don't always fit in an algorithm. Thank you, Carl. The last one. Yeah, this, this was fun. Uh, I mean, and look, there's a reason the word, uh, and it's funny, people say this all the time. People are like, oh, that's my six-year-old could have done that. You know, look, <laughs> what you don't know is the amount of thought and time. It's, this, it's the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So I know I've thought about the edge cases. I've thought about the nuance and I've purposely left the thing that out that I didn't think was what I was trying to get across. And I'm trying. So I was only going to point that out because you notice it says good investments, right? Like you could have a mediocre, by definition, average investment portfolio. And if you behave well, you'll do better than 99% of your neighbors. And that in America, at least, is what life is all about anyway, right? Like that's sort of a joke. So it, it's different. We could have, this, this could have been flipped. We could have said best portfolio ever created by the mind of man. One behavioral mistake a decade in the other circle and the overlap could have been labeled should have just stayed in term deposits. 
So that's the point here is that it's, I'm trying to emphasize, and the circle is bigger too. Great behavior is bigger. So those, I was trying to get across the fact that it's the behavior that matters more. Like arguing about the investments is like arguing about misdemeanors when most of us are still committing felonies in the form of poor behavior. Thank you, Carl, that's fantastic. Um, what's interesting, sorry, Phil, sorry. What's interesting about that? You don't need to go back. What's interesting about this, that conversation for me is, you know, I've spent the last seven years building BIQ out to be an evidence-based behavioral insights company, which is which that right circle is about having an evidence-based framework to understand what behavior is and why it matters. The left-hand side, you could argue, is the evidence-based investing piece. So, you know, it, it's about having a framework whereby you can, that, that little kind of crossover there in the Venn diagram, if you like, is, is saying, if you have an evidence-based investment approach and an, an evidence-based behavioral insight approach, then actually that middle piece becomes a really valuable part of that picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and to find out more about the... Um... The, uh, the fellowship and to um, access that bundle. There's the link, Dan's gonna put it in the, in the chat. Uh, and that offer is open until the, the 26th of October. Um, so, and we'll, we'll put the link in the, um, in the show notes to this when we send around the recording later on this evening. Um, but Neil, I wanna come back to you if that's okay. Um, and just pick up something that you'd said, you said earlier. Um, and you talked about um, uh, the, some of the planners that you worked with had got a list of the clients who were, I've written it down, melting in their living room with anxiety. Um, just talk to me a bit about how planning firms can plan now or can, can strategize for the future, for next time this happens and how they can start understanding which of those clients are gonna be melting with anxiety to use your phrase. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to, uh, my, the academic side of my brain, the science side of my brain saying, I'm going to have to see if um, anxiety increases body temperature. I think it does. So, um, <laughs> you know, you can get to a point where you could legitimately melt. Um, so th there's a couple of things here, Phil. So, so I'm going to just repeat some of the stuff I've already said. So for, for, what, for me, it's about getting intimate, in inverted commas, with the client so that we can understand how they navigate a noisy 21st century world how they process information you know and and you can do that by having a great behavioral insight into how they do that so for example we all know that every human being on the planet suffers with behavioral bias and if i pick on framing bias as an example so how we make a decision based on how information is presented to us we all have our own unique strength of that bias from weak to strong and if you just kind of say from naught to 100 Every single person on this call, every human that walks the planet has a, a strength of framing bias. And that's the same for every behavioral bias, by the way. Now, if I know that there are clients who have a strong framing bias, and I know that they're on social media all the time, and I know that they also have a strong confirmation bias, then what that tells me immediately is that the, the, the way they are navigating the world is going to be, they are going to react to the news and they're going to form opinions very quickly. And they're going to hear statistics presented by Public Health England or by the government on the nightly news. And they're going to listen to what they, they're going to listen to what they hear and they're going to react without digging into the detail and figuring out what the other side of the, of the story is. So, if, so I think advisors need to accept that just saying, I know my client, Actually, yes, great. But having an intimate and evidence-based understanding of what's going on in their unconscious mind absolutely moves your conversation on in, in leaps and bounds, if you like. And so, so that's kind of one aspect. The other aspect is we also need to remember that we're all unique. You know, we all process information in our own unique way. And what you tell me in your head as you're saying it may make perfect sense. But as it kind of hits my oral cortex and I start processing that information internally, I compute that in my own way. Even my wife, who knows me more than better than any other human being on this planet, will hear and process that information in her unique way. So we need to accept that, you know, one message never has fit all. It never has. It's about being, you know, you, it's about delivering a unique experience for each and every client. But you can't do that unless you really kind of understand um, at, a, at an evidence-based level, who those clients are. Um, and and the, the, the final thing I would say is more of a, of, of a be prepared statement, 
you, you know, it doesn't matter how well you know a, a person, human beings are guaranteed to do one thing and it's kind of like to catch you off guard and to surprise you with something, you know, so we always need to be prepared. And if we have a structure, a framework in place, whereby, you know, it goes harking back to Carl's point and, and telling people what to do. I know Carl from an economic perspective and I know who he is and I know what his, what his dreams and his aspirations are, et cetera, but I know who he is from a personal perspective. And I now know who he is from a behavioral perspective. That just gives me the best chance at delivering the best outcomes um, for that client. It also allows me to spot the telltale signs of when I say to someone like Carl, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm okay. And I go, mm, he's not, he's not. You know, and, and that's based on, on those kind of those three factors. It's about, yes, knowing the client because you work with them, but it's about understanding what's going on inside of here and, and carving out the difference between the subjective self, who a person thinks they are, and the objective reality of who they really are. And if you understand both sides of that story, you, you're in a much better position to help and serve clients. So it's a genuine understanding is, is mm -hmm. clearly important. Um, guys, um, Carl, you take this first. Uh, what do you think are the most effective ways of communicating with clients, of guiding them, being their guide, um, tactically, if and when this happens, this happens again? Yeah, I mean, I think step one is get on the phone and call them. I mean, and, and Neil pointed this earlier, like, yeah, if you send an email, make it personal. You know, just, just show that you, and again, pieces of that could be cut and paste from something you're trying to communicate, but, but make sure that they know. But I think even better is just jump on the phone and call. Um, and then we can move up the level, right? Like jump on the phone and call, get on a video chat. So you can see now in video chat, look, there's a lot you can do. If you just at little improvements, little thought about lighting and sound and looking in the camera, Seth has taught me this. He spends a lot of time here, you know, just very close looking in the camera and little changes in video make a massive difference. Um, and one thing to think about too, we use a service a lot called Vidyard. You can use, use Loom. Um, so Loom, or I think there's one called BombBomb. I don't know, I have a hard time even saying it out loud, but Loom where you can record personal videos to clients and send them super easy to do. We do that a lot. You would, the, the perceived value of video is through the roof. And if you're good at it and you've got an iPhone, like this crazy secret, don't tell anybody, but the camera on an iPhone is world-class, right? Like, and, and so you can record some really high quality, this little mic that I've, you can't really see it here, but that's a $10 mic plugs into my iPhone. Sounds great. So a good quality video. So personalized messages in the medium that you're willing to do as a place to start. I think we've, we've started using video more um, and it works. It works an absolute treat. It's, it's more efficient, but it's so much more personal engaging. Neil, what about you? Yeah, there's a, a, not a great deal to add. I would, echo, I would echo what Carl said, actually, by the way, maybe because I've done a, a great deal of filming in the, in the past, that actually staring down the camera when you're talking to people just instantly creates a connection. Because now you're looking directly into my eyes, you know, virtually, but you, you know what I mean? It's really, as opposed to kind of talking and looking off camera all of the time and, and kind of looking around, just it creates a disconnect. So, so I agree, personalized video. And the thing is with, you know, Carl's right, you know, my iPhone, it records in 4K. And you know, it's ridiculous quality for the size of, for the device, if you like. But also I think just even recording of a, 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 a verbal kind of WhatsApp message Oh, hi, how are you? I just want, so they can hear your voice. They're not just reading your words, they are hearing you. It creates that connection. Um, but I guess I can kind of sum it up in, you know, I think people need to be clear. I think they need to be empathetic, fact-based, consistent in their message, but ultimately they just need to be human and accept that, yes, you know, that, that there's a lot of stuff going on and, and ultimately it boils down to one point, I have to communicate. I can't hide. I have to communicate. And even just having that, uh, that point, coming to that decision, whether it's an email, a phone call, a WhatsApp message, a video message, just reach out and let people know that you're there. Yeah, it's, it's so important. I remember back in March, we, we published our 
um, I forgot what we called it now, Coronavirus Guide to Communications or something something along those lines. It was downloaded about 8,000 times um, and we're going to rewrite it. So uh, week tomorrow, uh, we'll be putting out our, our blueprint for preparing for next time. We'll be taking a load of the good stuff from Neil and Carl um, on, this, on this webinar and we'll be publishing that next Friday. So uh, if anyone wants a copy of that, just let us, let us know. Um, but tactically, what... What should planners be doing right now, uh, Carl, to prepare for next time? Um, we know some of the good things that they did, um, picking up the phone, et cetera. We know some made some mistakes, which was incredibly understandable given what we were all facing. Um, but a couple of takeaways. What should they be doing now to prepare for quote unquote next time? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, other than what we've already talked about in terms of being visible and, and um, communicating and clearly being in touch with clients, I mean, I think the other thing to do is to make sure that we're on the same page as in terms of the plan, right? Like if, if you haven't had that conversation, I would imagine given the audience we're talking to, most people have, but if you haven't, because there's a huge chunk of most of the advisors in the world are not planning based right? There's still, it's still around a product, even if the portfolio is the product, you know, there may not be some direct link to goals and the, the why I like to think of it as there's no statement of financial purpose. If you don't have a statement of financial purpose for each client, whatever you call it, right? You've been given an excuse to have that conversation that you may have wanted to have, but you felt a little weird because I've been working with you for 10 years. I've never asked you about your goals. You've now been given an excuse to do all sorts of things. You can do meetings in front of a blue couch in your bedroom. You can have the dog bark in the background. Like you have permission to say to a client that's been a client for 10 years, you can say, Phil, I know we've been working together for 10 years and I'm pretty sure, I'm giving you the exact language. I've worked on this for a decade, this language. I'm pretty sure I know the answers to what I'm about, to the questions I'm about to ask you, right? So you're just pointing at the fact that, you know, even though you may not, right? You could say, well, you can't say it if it's not true, but I, I think you probably know what makes them tick financially, what their goals are, what worries and concerns, why they're investing money. So you can say, um, I'm pretty sure I know the answers to these questions, but given what's gone on, you know, people's plans have changed. People's goals have changed, their dreams, their desires, what they thought was valuable. They've, they've been questioning that. And so I just want to have a, a conversation about it real quick. And then you dive into your favorite question. You know, Bill Bacharach's version of that would be, why is money important to you? Or Dan Sullivan's version of that question is, if we were meeting three years from now, what would need to happen in order for you to feel personally and professionally like it was a success? You know, George Kinder's got his version but it gives you permission to have that conversation. Even if you've got an existing track record, I would be doing as many of those a day as I could right now until I've had that conversation with every single client because it gives us a touchstone. And then we can say, based on what you've said, do the investments match what you've said here? Okay, they do, or they don't. We need to make some tweaks. So get the plan in shape, right? Why you still can. Fantastic advice. Neil, what would you add to it? And then we'll throw it open to everybody else for their questions because I've dominated things. There genuinely isn't a great deal to add to that. That was a, 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 a top superb answer. The, I guess the only thing that I would add um, is, and Carl used the word permission, and I'm gonna use it in a different context here. I think we just need to give clients permission to be scared, uncertain, anxious, worried, yeah, and sure. fearful. Um, we need to give them that, that the ability to say, no, I'm not okay. But what I would be doing practically is I would be having conversations with clients and I would, but I, and I would be asking this older stuff that Carl asked, but I would, I would also ask them, you know, how do you, you know, tell me your experience of what you went through over the last six months. How did you feel when this first happened? How did you feel when you saw this happen? And, and, and don't just ask it for the sake of asking it, ask it because it, it, for, it will form the basis for how you deal with a client going forward. In other words, learn from what they've just been through. Because if when it happens again, history is likely to repeat itself. Now I will kind of throw an air of caution to this because one of the things that we know from kind of psychology, social science is that people will suffer with hindsight bias and people will suffer with memory distortion. So when they do remember what they did and how they reacted, 
yes, we can use that as a basis, but we shouldn't use it explicitly as they will absolutely do this again, because every single moment of life is unique. Yes, history can repeat itself and things can look and feel similar, but there will always be little nuances that makes that experience unique in the way that we process that information in our brains. So in essence, everything Carl said, but I would also use this time to understand how clients felt and kind of use that as a gauge to understand how they may feel going forward. That allows you to be wholly proactive and just do that thing that Carl and, and I have now said, pick up the phone and say, are you okay? Thank you, Neil. So it's been a fabulous hour. Um, it's delivered everything and more that I hoped it would. Hope everybody else who's on the call um, feels exactly the same way. Um, Dan, questions. Where do you want to start? Right. So I think we'll start with a question that came in from Chris. And Chris asks, how can you tell when you might be applying your own values to a client's situation, not theirs? He's going to yeah. tie that to start with. Look, I mean, my short answer is ask them. I think like we, 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 we can just do a lot of confirming. Like, I think I heard this. Did I get that right? right? Because what we want to do is nail the sort of values, purpose, and goals in their language. And if we do it, there will be an emotional resonance to that. Like, yeah, that's, that's all. I think that's exactly what I said, actually. Right. So you just, and, and I think it, it's so funny how we feel about this. Like we feel like we we might look, we might look dumb if we ask somebody to repeat something or if we ask a clarifying question, or if we say something like, I'm not sure I understood this. This is something I didn't realize. Um, I call it crunchy. Like just pay attention to when there's a crunchy moment, you know, like there's, there's something more to the, like, and so you can just, I, I find myself saying this all the time. Like I, I sense, <laughs> I sense there's something behind that. Like, is, is, is there more there? Brian Koppelman on the moment. It's the best podcast you, I mean, I think it's one of the best podcasts to listen to, to understand follow-up questions because Koppelman will say things like go deeper. That's all they'll say. Tell me more. So I think, Chris, the answer is you just ask clarifying questions. And if you're at all worried about that, just go, did I nail this or, or am I seeing this through my own lenses? Right. That's all I'd say. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And, the, the, and, and the, the, I guess the one point I would add, and it goes back to something I said earlier, you know, we three and a half million years in the making as a species, we have become incredibly fine tuned at just looking at another human being and knowing that there's not, something's not right. You don't even need to ask them the question. You know, you can sense it, you know, and you know this, right, from your relationships with people. You know, you'll say to someone, you're all right, and they go, yeah, and you kind of just know they're not. You know there's something there, and it's like that sixth sense, if you like. And that's what, you know, we, we, we picked up that skill. It's why, by the way, as, a, as an aside comment, I, I am absolutely adamant that robo advice will never replace real advice because it'll never be able to replace that human aspect that we are so fine-tuned that I can't see tech ever replacing that. A, a computer can't look at me through the camera and go, actually, are you all right? It, it just it, it just will never be able to do that, I don't think. Um, so it's about everything that Carl said, but I think it's just about using these things and just observing reaction and playing back. Have I got this right? Is this what you said? You know, because I just want to make sure. But you will also be able to tell the second you prod someone in, in, in at the part of them, which is one of their values, and you're prodding them in the wrong place, I, I would argue that you would visibly see the reaction and, and, you'll, and it'll change. There'll be, an emo, there'll be an emotional resonance to use that phrase that Carl said. And so it's about doing it what Carl said, but I thought also just think observing as well and, 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 being, and giving yourself permission to change your narrative and step back and go, oh mate, okay, I got that wrong. Sorry, my, let, let's, let's get this right. Phil, let me just mention something here that's important to understand. Like sometimes this, this conversation we're having here gets painted as like, you know, I, I sometimes refer to it as like super California, right? Like it's woo woo and it's fancy feelings and it's people crying. And we come from an industry where we're like sales and numbers and stuff and things that we can measure. And I just, for those people that feel that, I think A, it's really important to understand this is where the business the, the, the practice, the craft of financial planning is going. It's been there for a long time, but throw that out for a minute. The single best way I know, if, if what you care about is selling, 
right? Because you equate selling to impact or maybe even more. You equate selling to the business being successful, fine. The single best way I know is to listen to people. Right? The single best way I know is to get somebody to talk about themselves because they'll release, Neil's gonna correct me if I'm wrong, oxytocin in their brain and that, that is a chemical reaction that's designed as I'm talking about myself, it's designed to help me like the person who asked me the questions, <laughs> for me to feel an affinity to somebody who listens to me, to make somebody who makes me feel emotionally safe. I like them. Oxytocin's what does that, right? It's, it's so you can think of this as California if you want. You can also think of this as the most powerful genetically designed hardwired selling tool you'll ever hear. And it turns out, you know, they're both right. Dan, let's get through as many of these questions for people as we can, because uh, it's great to have Neil and, and Carl here. Your thing. So the next question I'm going to ask is from Richard. And Richard asks, most of the focus has tended to be on the relationship between planners and existing clients. However, one of the biggest challenges with the vast majority of the world's population who have no planner, are there any suggestions you can share in trying to encourage more of the population to seek advice? Who shall we start with there? Neil, you look like you've got an answer on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> That's a, it's, a great, it's a great question because there's an assumption in, in there. I, I'm not saying there is, but I'm, I'm speaking out loud here. Let me think out loud for a second. There's almost like an, impl an implied assumption that people need advice in the first place. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think most people on this planet need help just to get their financial orders, their financial affairs in order. And actually what I think, for, if you take that bunch of people, I think just pe people just need to start saving more money and spending less. So it's not necessarily about financial advice per se. It's about giving them access to an expert who can help them sort the crap out and, and, and get on a sure footing. Then later on, the advice part comes into play about right now. You now we've sorted that out. Let's plan for the future. Let's invest some money, etc., etc., etc. But I do think we have a, a a big job to do to portray the image of what we do as an industry. You know, I, I, I hear this from some people that it's still, it's still seen as like this elitist part of the profession that is only valid for rich people. And, and, and that's clearly not true. We, you know, if, if, if at our heart, we wanna help people with their financial well-being, which has a knock-on effect to their physical, mental well-being, et cetera, et cetera, then actually our conversations need to be much, much broader than just you know, the, the investing conversation or the retirement conversation. It needs to be about debt management, spending, borrowing, philanthropy. You know, I can keep going on with, with that list. So I think in a nutshell, and again, I'm thinking out loud and blabbing here, but I do think that ultimately it's about making this industry more appealing and broadening its reach to more people. And I don't think we've cracked that nut at all. Dan, back to you. Okay, so a question from Robert here, and it's a great question. Um, have you got an alternative for emails um, that don't start saying, hope you are well? What's a good <laughs> way to start a personable email? Carl, what do you make of that? Yeah, I, that's a really good question because we've seen a whole bunch of that lately. Um, I was thinking about you today. How are you? Um, I read something today that I thought you would find interesting. I, you know, hey, John, I had a conversation with a friend today and it made me think of you, right? That's, that's some of the ways I would do it. Cool. Dan, let's keep them coming. Okay, so one from Alan here. If you're a guide, there are times when you need to tell people what to do, even if it is telling them they are, they are wrong. So for example, do not step off the path here as you're in danger of falling off the cliff. How do you communicate this without telling them what to do? I think, so I'm, let, me, let me jump on this one first. I think it goes back to the conversation that Carl and I had, right? So in the, in the financial sense, you know, you could argue there's a precipice, there's a cliff, you know, you could jump off at the market's bottom and, and that, that's your metaphorical cliff. Um, but if you, if you know the client, as we, Carl and I discussed earlier, then I have absolutely no issue in saying to people, a client, no, you, you should not be doing this. 
um, as long as it completely aligns with their values, their principles and their plan, all of the things that we've talked about before. Um, but don't get me wrong, you know, in, in the, sorry, the financial world's one thing, but in the, the physical world, of course, you know, we, we all have, you know, many of us have children and many of us don't have children, but ultimately you, there's times when you need to reach out and say, no, you are not doing that because you absolutely know that the result of that action will be, will, will put people in, in a terrible, a dangerous or a perilous position. But in the financial context, all I said and, and all I mean when I say we shouldn't tell clients what to do is we shouldn't push our values and our principles on people. We shouldn't be telling them what to do because we think it's right and I don't care what you think. That's That, that for me, is where it, it goes wrong quite quickly. Hey, Phil, I hate to interrupt, but can I just mention one more thing about the earlier question about educating people how they need our services? I was just sitting here thinking about my conversation yesterday with Seth. Okay, he's been writing a personal blog for every day for 15 years, I think. There are 75,000 posts. It's the most popular individual website on the planet. And then he said, 99.9% .9 of the American population has never read my blog. And he said, the truth of the matter is, most people don't need you, right? Most people won't, and yet it's enough, right? Like the, the, everybody doesn't exist right? Everybody no longer exists. Only the somebodies that you really need to help. And so I know that's not exactly what the person who asked the question was pointing out at all, because I do think there's a huge section of the population that actually does need financial advice that doesn't know what it exists. And Neil pointed to this earlier. I always think of that as the U.S. Supreme Court's definition of pornography. They said, we don't know how to define it, but we know it when we see it. We've got to give more people the experience. We don't tell them they need it. We say, here's like, I was having a conversation today and we had, we talked about this, this, and this. So we, we, we point at it. Like we teach in parables, <laughs> we teach in stories. So people can go, oh, that I've, I've never thought of it that way. And then they realize, oh, that's what it means because we can no longer say you can trust us. We can no longer say you need us. We can no longer say we're wealth managers, we're financial plant. None of those words matter to anyone. We can no longer put a picture of a lighthouse or a, or a, a sailboat or a compass and hope that it means clients will suddenly sign up. So all we can do is tell them stories of what it means, let them experience it vicariously and then realize it's not for them if they don't get it. Because you don't have time to educate the world you're going to help your hundred best people, right? That's all you need. I've got, we've got a, I've got a client, a, a advisor friend that's got 25 clients and an 18 month waiting list. You know, they, they only need 25. So it's not for everyone. Sorry. I just, it, it, this is bouncing around in my head and I wouldn't let it go. Yeah. There's an element of that Carl as well, isn't there? Right. About, you know, if we, if we portray ourselves outside to the outside world, you know, people will process the information in, in their own way. And if we're trying to convert them to our uh, to, to financial advice yeah. by, by relying on them, on their cognitive processing, we'll fail. But if we go after them from an effective perspective, if we try and create that emotional resonance, resonance, if we try and get them to feel that this is valuable through amazing storytelling and, you know, then, then uh, and they go, oh, that's me. That's what I want. That feels right. All of these words, these California words, right? Um, that's how you get people on the hook. That's how you get people into your world by making them feel like this is something that I want to take part in. If we rely on them to process that and come to that cognitively, I don't think it's, it's one of our, it's, it's the failing. It's the Achilles heel. Hey, hey, Phil and Dan, I know you have some questions, but this might be really useful. So let me just, let me just tell a, a super quick story. And, and, and I, if we miss a story, I think people will benefit from this. So here's an example of a story. This is gonna be recorded. So feel free to use this story, right? I, one day, there was a, there's a, I had a client, his name was Dave. So you could tell the story. I heard a friend of mine tell the story about his client named Dave. And Dave was an emergency room doctor. And Dave worked at a hospital that was right, he specifically went to work for, at this hospital because the emergency department was 50 yards away from the, some of the best trails in the, in the country. And everybody else that worked at the hospital specifically worked there as well. It was a hospital known for people who love to go out and trail run and mountain bike because the trails were right there. 
One day, Dave left on his lunch break, Dr. Dave left on his lunch break. And as he was walking out, he looked into the break room and he saw the other doctors and some of the staff crowded around the TV watching the Financial Pornography Network. And he went on his run and he realized about halfway up the trail and he called my friend who was a financial planner. He's called me. He called my friend and he said, Carl, let me just tell you what about what just happened. I was just leaving to go on my trail run. And on my way out, I looked in the room and I saw all the other doctors and nurses and staff watching the Financial Pornography Network crowded around the room and I realized I wasn't there, right? Thank you. That's an actual phone call. I know everybody else in that room wants to be out here too, but I wasn't there. Thank you. That's a, look, that's a way you could tell that story and somebody could go, oh, that's what financial planning means. And I never use the word financial planning. I never, so that's an example. I would just be on the hunt for those stories and then I would share them everywhere. Sorry. No, it adds a huge amount, Carl. And uh, we yeah. all love a story. It's, it's, thanks for doing that. Um, Dan. Sure. So the next question is from Ian. And Ian asks, how do you get more comfortable with asking deeper questions, such as why is money important to you? And how do you then follow that conversation through? Practice. Sorry, there, there's, I don't have anything else to add other than just like, you just practice. I promise it will feel hard at first because these questions are designed. A good question by definition is a question that somebody may not have ever been asked before. When you're asked something you've never been asked before, you, it might feel uncomfortable. Notice that uncomfortable is a sign that you're doing something right and then practice. Just keep going, Dan. Absolutely. Um, okay, we've got a question from Dan. What do you think about not taking on clients in the first place if they don't seem like a good fit? Neil? <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a, a financial planner, but I can speak from um, from an experience of having a business where we go out and see clients, right? I think from, so let, but let me try and flip that into the financial planning world. Why would you want to work with somebody who is going to be a royal pain in the backside? Why would you want to work with someone who takes up 90% of your time and your effort, both physically and mentally and emotionally, you know, for, for to be recompensed by, you know, financially through, through your through fees etc i for me i think it's i i think i only ever want to work with people who um i enjoy working with and who i can genuinely add value with who i can genuinely have empathy with and who and who will value you know that conversation Carl said about the doctor who who would who would recognize the value that i bring um and therefore understand that it's a it's about the relationship and it's about an experience so for me, it's really clean cut, and maybe I'm being really brutal. Um, I would never, ever, if I understood this person is going to be too tough to work with, I would rather just say thanks, but no thanks, go and find somebody else. That, that's me just being brutally honest. Carl, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, the one step further would just be, I think you have an obligation. And like, forget maybe the people that you don't like. Let's pretend like there's somebody you do like but they have a problem that you're not interested in solving, right? In other words, you've defined your narrow niche, which I would suggest get narrow as possible, and they're outside of it. They'd be a great client revenue wise, and you happen to like them. You still have an obligation, I think, to say, look, if it's not a good fit, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you. Then you discover it's not a good fit, and you should say, it's not a good fit. Right? I'm not qualified to help you. Seth said yesterday in our interview that you should pay attention to how often you're sending people to your competitors. It should be a good sign because it means you're getting this narrow thing clear. He said authors blurb other authors' books all the time, right? And we should be looking at, at, at doing that. So, and I think you have an obligation to do it. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's not in your niche, if it's not a problem you're capable or interested in solving, then you have an obligation to tell them, hey, this isn't a good fit. And I happen to know somebody 
who's really good. Why don't you go see Allison? She'll be great. I've told her you're coming. Or if you, if, if it's okay with you, I can even introduce you. Dan, how are we doing? Okay, one from Alan. So just going back to the Californian thing, this all works <laughs> great with the existing clients and perhaps even chatty new ones. But how does the panel think this best works with the, the stiff upper lip Brits who can sometimes be a bit of a stone wall and uh, who have been taught to expect a transaction perhaps? Yeah, I, Neil, you want me to uh, take you a go, yeah, this? You, you go for it, go for it. I was the one that opened this door. Um, so look, I, I realize that that can be a challenge. Um, and, and I hear, what's funny is I hear this, this, this cultural thing I don't know if you know this, but every place I go in the world tells me the same thing. You know, we've got to, we're too buttoned up for that. It's too formal or too, and, and I actually, for the first time I, after living in London for a while, I, maybe I'll believe it. <laughs> you know, when they told me that in, in New Zealand, I was like, nah, I don't think so. So, um, but, but it's a human problem. So I think you just look, people don't have to cry in your office. Like it doesn't have to be that deep. But we can just, I would say, just keep going back. Like when they're expecting a transaction, I know they come into your office for that. If that's the look they've got on their face. Like, what have you got for me, kid? And they want to sort of have a nice, healthy debate about plane, train, or automobile. And you just have to find ways to creatively say, hey, before we have that debate, which by the way, I'm really good at. Like I know my cars, I know my trains, and I know my airplanes. I'm really, really, really good at it. I don't think you can go anywhere else to find somebody this good at this. But before we do that, I've really, it'd be a disservice if we didn't have a conversation about where you're going <laughs> before we decide which mode of transportation to take. So believe me, we'll get there. But first, could you help me understand where you want to go? Like sometimes we call that goals. Let's talk about that. Why are you doing this? All right, so maybe you soften it a little bit and you don't say, why is money important to you? Like maybe, right? But I think if you do it right, you can play the dance correctly. This is the craft that just takes some practice, but don't let them change it on you, right? You're the doctor, they aren't, right? You're the one who knows how to diagnose, not them. And let me give you one last example. If somebody is insistent on this, right? It's about performance portfolio. Hey, listen, kid, I'm not here for this like California conversation as we're calling it. Like, uh, just tell me what you got. My favorite way to handle that was to say, okay, okay, gotcha. Like if, you know, you've tried two or three times, I call it the last arrow. The last arrow is, I got you. Now explain again why you came in today. Oh, well, the guy down the street's been terrible. Like I'm, my performance has been terrible. Okay, so performance has been bad from the guy down the street. Okay, got it. Explain to me, just help me understand, how did you find them? Like, how did you get introduced to them? So then they walk you through, probably what they're going to walk you through is I went in, I had a, I, we talked about it. He showed me some great performance portfolios. And then you can essentially say, oh, got it, got it. And now you're unhappy, got it. And you want me to repeat the same experience as you had with them. And you're expecting it, again, it's the last arrow. I mean, this may mean they leave, it's fine, right? You want me to repeat the same experience and expect a different result. And then I would say, can I humbly suggest there's a slightly different way? Like if we went about this a different way, we might have a chance of getting a different outcome, which is what I want for you. So that's how I'd handle that. I, I, I just want to add to this. There's two things that pop into, pop into my mind here. There's one, so that this, this stiff British upper lip, um, which of course is, is a thing that I've grown up in, with all of my life. There's a really, it's like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? It's about giving people permission to, to just to speak and be themselves. And I think a lot of the, the, the conversations that have happened kind of in days gone by haven't done that. We haven't even broached that subject, right? So I think it's about creating a safe space where people can just be themselves and can open up. And if you ask the proper questions and you construct those questions in the right way, then they will, I think, to varying degrees, open up with you and let you in a little bit. But if that fails and you need to understand, you know, what's going on inside of their heads, then, you know, and, and, and I'm not plugging anything here, but that's kind of like the, the last seven years of my life is trying to figure out how can you get put people through a digital process that's fun and engaging, that doesn't scream right or wrong at them, but reveals who they are. 
And then at least you're armed with that information. That, so their the stiff alpha lip is intact. They don't want to let you in, but you can get in through a different route, if you like, and still learn about who they are and how they how they, they navigate the world. But I, I'm you know, echoing what Carl said um, as well. But for me, it's about creating that safe space and giving them permission just to, to be who they want to be when they want to be it. Yeah, amen. Okay, so one in from Ross. And Ross says, one of my biggest frustrations is having a really productive meeting with a client where we discuss lots of things that that client could and should be doing to help them meet their personal objectives, only to then have the same meeting six or 12 months later and discovering they haven't done any of those things. How do you get clients to follow through with the great advice that you're giving them? You repeat it. I used to get frustrated too, and then I realized eh, that's kind of my job, especially for that specific client, right? It's, I had a client, her name was Martha. It was just, I figured out my job for Martha was to pick up the phone once a month when she called because she was scared about some, something in some far flung part of the world. It took me a couple of years, like, wait, I told you last time. <laughs> it took me a couple of years to realize like, oh my gosh, I guess that's my job with Martha. Right. And so you just do what you can. I mean, you decide, you don't follow my advice, get out. That's one way. Another way would be, you know, I'm just going to chip away at this. I'm here for you. We'll just keep repeating it. I think we need to remember as well in this conversation that, you know, when, when I walk out of my financial planner's office, Neil Bage's life continues as it, as it was before I walked in the office, all of the thing, all of the other million and one things I have to deal with in my 24 hours you know, are still there. They haven't vanished. I just have to now slot in other things that are the, are the, are the outcomes of my financial planning meeting. So I, I think we need to also be <clears throat> conscious that the financial plan, the advice we give people and the steps we give them to take aren't the only things that they've got going on in life. So I think having that, that, that um, you know, getting on the phone and just saying, just checking in, you know, how are you? How are you getting on with that thing I asked you to do? just gives people that little nudge they need in order to kind of reprioritize again. But I think if you can create that emotional attachment to the things that they're doing, there's more, you know, the evidence suggests that there's more, a, a stronger likelihood that people will follow through with the action if they feel that there's an emotional attachment and, and, it, and it resonates with them. So I think there's two things. It's about just constantly saying, have you done it? Have you done it? Have you done it? Because people will procrastinate because life takes over. Um, but also trying to make the steps bite-sized and give, give each of them almost like their emotional resonance at the same time, because then there's a likelihood that they'll follow through. Yep. Absolutely. So I think many of the other questions follow similar themes that we've already covered. Uh, we do have one um, question, though, that we can have as a, as a final one. And this is from Carolyn. And Carolyn says, do you have any final recommendations on hardware for video? So for example, that microphone that Carl mentioned or the, the camera on an iPhone, um, anything also like editing programs and software. So those sort of things that people can easily use. I'll do mine real quick because I do a lot of it and I, I, I embrace constraints. So like I, so I try to use the simplest possible tool. So this, I have a, a Rode, it's, it's R-O-D-E and I think it's called their Smart Lav. It's literally just, it just plugs in here on my shirt. Um, I sometimes I, and it, it's so small that it, it, I can take it with me. So if I'm doing something on my phone, I can just hold the mic, right? So that goes a long ways. The mic on your phone is already pretty darn good on an iPhone. The camera on the iPhone with a tripod. So I've just bought a selfie stick. My daughter just rolls her eyes every time she sees it. But I have a selfie stick with a tripod. So I'll just set up the phone, plug this, Road mic in, do the video, hit stop. I try to be one take Frank, Frank Sinatra. So I don't, I don't need any editing. And, and, but if you, if you need editing, we all know people who do a good job with video. You, you know, you upload the video to Dropbox. Once a week, they go through and clean them all up, send them back to you. You post them all over the internet. You say, if you like this, you'd love my stuff here. You point to your landing page. This is all stuff Phil and Dan do all day long, but tech stuff, the phone, a road mic, a logic tech webcam, those three things will put you in the top 1% of all Zoomers and you don't have to worry about the rest. I mean, there are obviously things you can do better than that, but the things you can do worse are infinite. 
Yeah, I, so I use my, so I film a lot for conferences and, and, and send video over and I've, I've video edited as a hobby for uh, over a decade now. So I have an yeah. editing studio in the house. Um, so, so I use professional, so I use Final Cut Pro X um, as my editing software, but actually even on an iPhone, iMovie is great if you want to edit something down. Um, I was introduced recently to an app for the iPhone called Filmic Pro, um, which is, a, is an amazing app. Um, so I use that. I use exactly the same mic as as Carl, the, the Rode Lav mic. Um, but it, but when I'm recording my voice, when I, I don't need to be seen, I also use a Yeti Pro um, mic, proper microphone as well. Just it's a, it's a great omnidirectional um, microphone as well. So um, the, but but also it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, the iPhone records in 4K. It's absolutely phenomenal quality. So even just doing that and using the mic on the iPhone, as long as you're in a quiet environment, of course, um, you can get some great videos. And actually, if you do it in a way, way where the world is seeping in, it creates an authenticity about it too as well. So um, th th there's so much amazing tech out there. Maybe you know I can share with Phil what I use and, and Phil can, you know, you know, can push something out, Phil, maybe. But there's, there's several things I use, you see. Absolutely. And I think if you do that, uh, both of you, I'll, I'll put it in the, the, the uh, blueprint that we're going to publish next week. Um, Dan, is that it for questions? I'd say that's been a fair representation of everything. Yeah. Right. I just want to say thanks to everybody. Uh, it's been a fabulous 90 minutes um, listening to Neil and, and Carl. It's been absolutely superb. And I really hope everybody who's spent the last hour and a half with us has got as much value out of it as I have. Um, we will be sending the recording tonight um, and we'll put links in there to the fellowship and uh, Neil, if it's okay with you, we'll put links in there to BIQ as well so people can go and see what, what you guys are doing and the, the fabulous stuff there. Um, and then next Friday, uh, a week tomorrow, we'll publish the Yardstick Blueprint uh, for the things you can be doing uh, to prepare you and your clients for next time. And we'll be leaning a lot uh, and very heavily on things people have said in this webinar. Uh, but lastly, a uh, massive thanks to Dan today for supporting me um, and for Neil and Carl for the value you've added over the last hour and a half. It's been absolutely superb. Um, thanks again, guys. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.